Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much indeed for coming. I'm not sure this is working. It's not. I do apologise for those online. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, we've got a full 60 minute session here today with Graham from the University of Sheffield. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points. If you do have a question, please uh, put your hand up and I'll come around with a mic and hopefully it will be working. Um, there is a, a Discord um, link. There's a chat uh, link in Discord in the workshop chat that takes you through to a VVOX page. So if you want to ask any questions on that, um, that's mostly designed for those online, but it's also available for those in the room as well. Um, but also, if you'll follow along as well, if you want to follow along with Graham, there will be links as well to uh, to join Wonder VR, I believe. Yes, and be indeed. In the session. Indeed. So I'm going to hand over to Graham now. Okay. Full sixty minutes. Very full sixty minutes. Yeah, yes. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great conference so far. I know I am. It's a real pleasure to be here again. Um, so what I'm going to do for the next hour, and possibly a little bit longer, but I'll, I'll mention that in a moment, is I'm going to um, have a look at um, some work we've been doing in Sheffield, where we've been building up support for 360 Media. And uh, I also um, was planning and have made plans for you to be able to do an actual hands-on uh, exercise as well. We've got some 16. Uh, if people would like to do so, um, in fact, I, I think I've done a little bit more. I might have my session planning eyes might have been bigger than my tummy, as we say. So we've got probably actually got a little bit more than 60 minutes worth. Are people more interested in hearing about 360 media and our approach or are people more interested in actually having a go at doing some just in case we have to kind of adjust the duration? So anybody got a sense? Who wants to hear? how Sheffield University have gone about supporting 360 Media, particularly. Oh, you're going to be 50-50, aren't you? <laughs> who's desperate? Who's desperate? Who, who really wants to have a go hands-on at doing so? Okay, a few less. All right. Um, I'll try and... Well, I'll tell you what. I, I could try and compromise by going super quick at such a speed that you can't understand anything I'm saying, but um, not really. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to ask you, those who wish to have a go at uh, signing up to the platform, uh, because our uh, partners in this, Wonder VR, have been very kind in giving us a, uh, a, a kind of demo instance of the, of, the, of, the, of the environment for us to use today. But to access it, I need you to uh, provide uh, an email address which you're happy for me to sign you up to the platform. It will then send you an email, and you would need to reply. Um, it will only work on um, actual laptops rather than phones. So you may have to buddy up with a partner if you haven't got one when we come to the hands-on bit. Um, so we'll do that in a moment. But firstly, I want to talk a little bit about um, 360 Media and why we're interested in it and what we perceive to be the benefits of 360 Media, a little bit about how we've supported it or, or what we're doing to support it. Uh, and then we'll we'll actually have a look at uh, the platform and, and as I said you can have a go should you so desire and as John said um, uh, if anybody uh, has got any questions from our online community if you can go on to the workshop chat channel in the discord uh, John's very kindly set up a link to our uh, vbox uh, Q&A channel which John is very kindly going to monitor for us so here's the thing if you want to have a go uh, I'm going to ask you to go um, to this Google form. Just need to put in your uh, email address that you're happy to use. So if you don't want to use your work one, you know, that's fine. I'll also make sure I clear them all out afterwards if you don't want them, you, you, your address to be, to be uh, on the platform afterwards. So getting into it then, um, we started supporting 360 Media as, as a kind of general move towards um, uh, supporting immersive and extended reality technologies. Sorry, I think there's a few problems. Can you just put that link back up? Yeah. Just check that people are using it correctly. Yes. Oh, okay. Ooh, have I done the... Uh... Extensive as well. Yeah. Okay, so I maybe have I done the... Um... Uh, school child error of uh, just give me two seconds. I thought I'd actually set this up.
Okay, I'm going to change the... Um... All right, let's try that again. Sorry about that, folks. I'm glad you pulled me up there. Um... Now, this might not be quite as nice and shortened as um, uh, the one I've just put on. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this into the Discord as well. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. Okay, so this, and now this isn't very pretty, is it? So what I'll do is I'll just copy this out and put this into the Discord channel. Um, give us a sec. Okay. You want me to read it out because it's a bit um, it's a bit cryptic, isn't it? It's forms.gle. I think I'm still getting an error. Are you? Oh dear me. Any experts in Google Forms? Yeah, I am supposed to be. I'm just looking at all the yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm just, I've just managed to. Uh, Strange why it's done that. Um, yeah, it should be. Unless you're using institutional account, it's a lot better. Sorry about the slopes. Yes, that might be a, um, a good way of doing it, actually. Let me just see about, just check one more thing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, I'm going to have to bypass that. I'm really sorry about this. Um, what we'll do is, um, John suggested if people don't mind, um, they could... Um, Actually, I'll tell you what the best way is. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, you could email them to me at this address instead. Um, Vicky Dale's asking, can we sign up ourselves or is it a case of being invited to a specific space? Um, if you send me the email, what we'll do is we're going to have a little breakout exercise in about 10 minutes time and I'm going to register people and you should be able to sign up then. Thank you. Okay, really sorry about that, folks. Um, let's get back to it. Okay, so if you want to just send any email address through to me at this address, I'll pick it up in our little breakout group. I will register you. Okay, moving swiftly on. So um, <clears throat> we introduced 360 Media um, as part of a wider exploration of how we could actually start to support XR technologies. And I think like most universities, Sheffield's had a sort of variable approach, a varied approach to this. And we've got some practitioners who are quite advanced, other people who have heard about it would like to get involved in it, but haven't really had the chance to do so. Um, 
And we identified 360 media as a way of a good, good entry point because it has quite a low technical uh, threshold barrier um, to entry. And I was wondering, has anybody here actually got any experience of creating or using 360 media in their work? Okay, so you've got a few, a few people. And is that, is that using or is that actually creating interactive environments? Creating? Brilliant. Okay, excellent. So, um, you, so to those people who have already been using 360, this is probably uh, something you're already familiar with. But um, <clears throat> what we define as 360 media is where we use a single or multiple interlinked 360 images um, or videos. And the most commonly experienced example is probably Google Street View, which I think is a very popular uh, you know, consumer level technology that lots of people have done. And so uh, just to quickly show a kind of example of uh, the sort of thing we might do, and this is actually what we'll hopefully do in our hands-on exercise. Here's an example of a, of a very simple virtual campus tour, which we've created uh, using the uh, platform that we've been uh, using, which is based around Wonder VR. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what we'll actually do in an exercise a little bit later on, and this is what we also typically show when we're introducing our, our colleagues and to how to actually use the technology. So we start off with a, an entry point, which is a 360 uh, photograph. This is actually outside the uh, Sheffield University Students' Union. We can create links uh, that link various different viewpoints uh, together. We can link static photos with uh, video content. So this is a 360 video, which is effectively like um, uh, like an image, but it has dynamic content, so it can be really good for sort of dynamic processes that you might want to show, also for guided tours. We can create uh, pop-ups to uh, provide supplementary information, which is great because it means we can actually build some interactivity in, and it also means in a complex environment like a lab or an operating theatre, we can present the space without overloading students with too much uh, extra information at once. Um, and then we can also uh, include other forms of information, such as uh, video. So we can pop, create a pop-up video. So we can bring video content in. Uh, this is actually brought in from our video server on Kaltura. And we can bring in um, uh, imagery quite easy, uh, simply as well. And we can, again, we can make that interactive. So that's actually quite a simple tour, but using those basic functional building blocks, we can actually develop some quite uh, sophisticated levels of interaction by combining different uh, scenes and different orders. Quite a few of those things can be made to be conditional. So, for example, the links that take you between scenes uh, can be triggered so that students have to go in and they have to interact in some sort of way with another bit of the environment before those are revealed. So we can create things like escape rooms and so on. Uh, here's a, another real world example. This is actually a virtual field trip of a stone circle in the uh, Lake District called Castle Rig Stone Circle. Um, I should say my background academically is, is in archaeology. So I first got interested in VR and archaeology in 2005, which was a very different kind of uh, landscape technically. Uh, uh, but it's a typical um, use case for this kind of technology to take people on virtual field trips and so on. So we can, we can do things like create uh, interaction around uh, the landscape uh, to reveal the landscape features. provides supplementary textual information, and also we can link to um, a 360 video, which provides us with a, a more dynamic kind of, uh, kind of encounter uh, with the landscape. So this is, uh, this is what it's actually like to approach uh, the castle rig monument on foot and that's quite an important learning outcome for students understanding about how prehistoric monuments are located in their wider landscape so um 
thinking about some of those um, pedagogical benefits and uses, uh, it's very much about, or a starting point to think about 360 is very much about what you might call location-based uh, study. So any, any study where location is the object of study, so for example, I've just shown you an example of a field trip where archaeologists like to take students out and look at monuments in the field. They are some of the primary things that archaeologists uh, study, but it could be um, uh, an architectural field trip to the built environment. Uh, it could be an engineering facility, and there could be many, many, many uh, examples. But also where location provides context of the object of study. So it could be, for example, a landscape that's inspired a piece of literature or indeed a piece of artwork. Um, field trips are really important for many kinds of study, as are laboratory work. Um, but they're also quite arguably expensive experiences and ones we like to make the most of. So um, 360 Media uh, provides ideal ways of introducing students to a, an environment in which they're going, going to learn um, and or uh, other sort of forms of creative work. So for example, if I'm going to take students on a field trip to the Lake District, it takes quite a lot of time to organize. I'd actually like to make sure that when our students get there, they're kind of orientated into the space that they're actually going to be exploring when they're there. It helps them to get a better experience from it. Ditto, we have uh, laboratory experiences, which for students who first come to university, they may have done science or chemistry uh, uh, science at school. Uh, when they actually get into a university laboratory environment, it's quite, it can be quite overwhelming. And we, we know that when we take students into other forms of environment that they've never been to before, for example, in medical context, factory context as well, it can be overwhelming. So it provides us a, a way to um, provide an induction to environments in which students can learn. We've also done work uh, which has been purely creative. So using the branching facilities of creative media, it gives people an opportunity to create immersive, non-linear um, narrative works. And I know we've, we're building some work out with colleagues in, in our English literature department where we're doing exactly that with them. So another way of thinking about it is, is allowing places, access to places that you can't normally visit. So we have a colleague, um, uh, Tom uh, Perring, in our uh, geography department. And Tom's a volcanologist, so he studies live volcanoes. Uh, that's what he actually does his research on. As I'm sure you can imagine, the kind of risk assessment of taking students to the side of a live volcano uh, would be as long as your arm. And so there's various practical problems with that. Uh, so he's been out to South America a couple of years ago and made this video. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the basic concept of the volcanology and introduce a few things which may or may not be familiar to you. So there you go. So we can actually situate students in the in the landscape of the uh, live active volcano, which itself is something that gives volcanologists lots of cues about understanding, is it going to pop? When will it happen? Is it going to be a slow burner? All the kind of things. But as I said, pretty tricky to actually take students to. Um, and the point being to actually, in, in terms of how we might integrate this into the curriculum, um, with either lab or fieldwork, for example, you can use it as a means of inducting students into an experience that they're going to have, but equally you could use it as a means of debriefing uh, post-field. And in fact, if you take a sort of augmented approach, you could also, it, theoretically on a mobile device, you could use it in situ as well to help guide students around that very vital um, immersion in the field experience. Other forms of experience we can capture that would be really difficult to do. So. Um, we have a, a, a tropical butterfly research facility under the main car park at, at the University of Sheffield. Uh, it's about 15 foot square. Uh, this is where people observe a butterfly behavior. Our current biosciences cohort has got something like 600 students in it. Uh, uh, so we probably would not in any way be feasibly able to run a first year practical with 600 students occupying um, uh, a butterfly house like that if we wanted to, but it does nonetheless uh, give students an opportunity to sit and, and actually record and observe 
their behavior and give some sense of what it's like to be in this environment. So there are many, many, many possibilities for how we can think about uh, deploying this. Just to recap, fully immersive, so we're looking at these on a desktop, but we can also consume these on a mobile device or a headset. And if you ever look at 360 Media on a VR headset, they do become fully immersive experiences. So you're not just looking on the screen, but you are in fact situated at the center of this whole 360 media bubble. They're inherently interactive. Uh, you have to really do something to interrogate the world that you're in, uh, and you can enhance that by providing uh, supplementary information via interaction and so on. Um, although, to counter that, there's also functionality that enables, enables you to provide a guided narrative. One way, as I said, is, is to work walk through with a 360 moving viewpoint, which you could give a guided tour. Um, also, in the platform we have here, you can make it automatically move from one location to another, and you could superimpose a vocal narrative over the top, so you could actually provide a guided tour in that sense. can also be multi-user collaborative, and in reality, you can combine any of those in any combination you like, so it's quite flexible. So, to try and compensate for my slight organization shortfall on capturing your number, I'm going to gather the email addresses that hopefully you sent me now, I can set you up with the platform. But anyway, in the meantime, um, uh, I've put a link here to a Jamboard, and I'll just invite you to talk uh, to your partner or for the next few minutes in a small uh, you know, tables, think about what uses you might think for uh, we could use 360 Media, either in your learning and teaching or in your institution. So just have a quick chat for, for five minutes, and then um, I'll be back right back with you oh it's okay it's okay i'll put it back here uh g dot mac um it's not a joke it really is mac uh, yeah i know it's great isn't it i don't <laughs> can't believe i still can't believe it you know i was telling somebody the other day it's like you know we've had fletchers who make arrows since the medieval period and we've had bakers baking bread since the neolithic but we've not really had e-learning people since about 1994, right? And yet I seem to have been born with this surname. How, how, how on earth? I'm just going to blank this screen. Has everybody got that? So I'm just going to have to, um, I don't want to reveal your email addresses to the wider group. So, yep, yep, yep. I've also put it in Discord in the workshop. Yes, thank, thanks, John. I'd like to thank John Cooper very much, by the way, for keeping me on track. <laughs> you wouldn't believe I actually do this for a living at this point, I guess. Um, I did. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, it is bitly forward slash alt slash c jam uppercase c jam. Oh, yeah, we got yeah. perfect. Right, yeah, right. 
Yes, for that, John. I think that's all in. I don't know why the so form wasn't working, but there you go. Yeah, that's pretty good. Right. Scrapping this, put it in Discord as well. Okay, folks. I've, I should now have uh, everyone who um, sent me an email should now have received an email from Wonder VR, um, which will give you an invite to come into our demo space. And I can tell by the general amount of uh, activity, both in the room and on the board, uh, we've had no shortage of ideas. Anybody got a specific idea they'd like to pick just qualify for a moment i'm not going to do picking on people um not not on not on day three of the conference that would be beyond cruel uh, but anybody got an idea out there that they'd like to um more archaeology field trips who put that on i am picking on someone now aren't i <laughs> who, who selected more archaeology field trips <laughs> intriguing ghost of graham so it must be anybody want to comment Anything out there? Any, any uh, online? Yeah, good question. Yeah. People. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we're very keen to use it in NHS settings, yeah. but it's just going to be very thorny with consent and that kind of thing, you know. But yeah, we're we're certainly going to investigate it because we've we've managed to get hold of some kit. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think that's right. I suppose um, procuring the media, like any media procurement, there may well be necessary levels of consent that you take. Um, you can edit images after you've 
created them so you could blur faces out would be another approach yes. or you could get people to consent uh, one thing that uh, while we're on the topic of consent and data protection um, a, a gray area for people is this idea of accidental inclusion so if I go uh, as I was going to do actually or I had thought about doing if, if we went out if we all went out on the street now with some 360 cameras and started taking pictures around the uh, the Warwick campus technically we're not really infringing any passers-by passerbys um, uh, privacy because it's it's basically accidental inclusion. Um, if we were if we asked several people to come over and sort of intervened with them and could show real detail of the faces, that would be quite different. That, that is some that is a question that that can recur. Um, lots of good stuff. Uh, our nursing colleagues are starting to make use of this. Um, Lots of lots of stuff about introducing people um, to environments. Fashion show is a really good example from I think New York State, um, who have used Wonder VR to create virtual fashion shows uh, to celebrate people's um, end of year work. There is a three D dimension to Wonder VR, which I wasn't really going to overly focus on, but I will I will mention it again in a little while. So thanks very much for bearing with me and. Um, Getting us, uh, getting us up and running. I hope you've all got those invites now. So we've seen the pedagogical benefits. Uh, there's also some practical benefits, and in, practical in terms of uh, people who are in central digital learning teams or distributed digital learning teams, people who are supporting others. Um, and again, I think it starts off with this idea that it really does offer a low technical threshold, a low technical barrier to enable people to get into creating immersive technologies, which can also be horribly complicated if anybody here has ever tried the hand at de devising virtual reality scenario, um, environments with environments like Unity or somewhere like that. It takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of time. Uh, the media itself can be produced using consumer level cameras. So most of the images that, we, that I showed you here were, were taken using quite a popular um, uh, popular consumer level device, which is about the size of a, well, it's smaller than a mobile phone. It's made by a company called Insta, Insta One X, and these things are three or 400 pounds. We have an AV loan facility at Shepherd, as indeed many colleagues will have, where you can just go and sign one of these things out for a few days. So you can actually get the kits to make the stuff. It's widely applicable, as we've said. Um, and I think what's really interesting is is when you take these things together, it kind of enables us to start democratizing the production of this kind of content. And I think that's really important. It's a really important component when we talk about th more elusive concepts of things like digital transformation and moving so the things forward. If you can't provide a technology that people can have on their desktops and that everyone can have, you will always be, you will always be putting uh, barriers uh, in people's in, in terms of that. So that's all great, but the problem was, and we knew all this a couple of years ago, but we had no platform for actually hosting it. So we needed to have an environment that we could say to people, okay, you're interested in using this technology, we're gonna enable you by providing a, pro a platform. So uh, for people, again, for the benefit of people who need to do this kind of thing, we went through a product selection and procurement process, which we did started about two years ago and, and, and went through some stages. For us, ease of use uh, was the primary uh, product requirement. We really don't want people, you know, if this is going to be a democratizing, easily accessible technology, then it has to be easily accessible. So ease of use is really big. We really were, uh, there's lots of products out there, by the way. Um, we wanted to be able to link images and videos, not they don't all do that, um, the one we went for did. Uh, we really wanted to have interactivity so that people could build things that you didn't just look like this, you could actually, you know, not just like Street View, you could actually build more into it. And this actually ended up being um, a biggie for us uh, and a bit of a killer. It had to have what we call a multi-user enterprise architecture. It had to be something that everyone could have their individual accounts and have their workspace and actually, um, just as you would, uh, you know, with, with any large video platform. Um, many of the products out there were just designed for a small team to work in, and there was no way of, of really sort of partitioning people's work away from each other. 
Um, it had to integrate with a VLE and it had to meet what we call another NFRs or non-functional requirements for a system. So it had to integrate with single sign-on. We definitely don't want to be in the business of running multiple account systems. It has to meet information security and data protection regulations as well. So after a bit of a selection process, we um, appointed uh, Wanda VR, who we'd first met via our um, colleagues in, in Kaltura as their as a strategic partner. And so the main functionality that we um, would appeal to us by this is that, that we could indeed fundamentally create these kinds of experiences like the one I've just shown you. Uh, they can be embedded in Blackboard. It's super easy to use, as I hope you're about to find out. Uh, it could give the kind of interactivity that we wanted so we could build these kind of meaningful interactions. And it has to have this enterprise scale architecture. So everybody's got their own account. Uh, it links into our single sign-on system. So when you log in, when you authenticate at University Shepherd, you get straight in. And a really key feature for us, um, because as people may have noticed during the pandemic, um, the, the rising costs of things like media storage and multiple storage estates are operationally expensive. The great thing about Wonder VR is it also links to our Kaltura media hosting thing. So the walkthrough video I showed you of Castle Rig Stone Circle, it's three and a half minutes long and it's about six gigabytes. Now that kind of data starts to add up in size quite a lot. You don't want to have to be kind of moving those into more accounts than you need to. Um, so anything we put into our Kaltura uh, system, if we tag it with the appropriate tag, it then becomes visible to us uh, in the Wonder VR, VR environment. Extra things we really like about it, we can create quizzes and they will tie in directly to the Blackboard Grade Center. Uh, we can do, um, actually we could do multi-user uh, 3D environments now and, and we've had some unexpected uh, successes with those. And I think that's, again, uh, something that can happen when you introduce a new technology. You might specifically think it's going to be used for one thing. People find some other really interesting uses um, of it as well. So we've done a lot of work with, um, uh, again, just in terms of the story of launching this and getting this out on people's desktops. Uh, we've done a lot of work on developing some web-based uh, media. Uh, we've done a series of introductory videos. Uh, some of which are um, conventional, some of which are in a 360 version. And we are now actively promoting it via a series of short courses. Uh, so going a bit meta, um, can, have people now received emails inviting them to the platform? Hopefully yes, you yes. should have got something that looks a bit like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Look at what email address you sent me. I'll just check I registered you guys. Which one's uh, which email address do you send it to? Okay, I'm not sure I don't check. I thought you had a moment. Um I'm just gonna check one more address. Yeah, just uh, one second. Ah, uh, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Well, there's I'll get started. I'll give people a chat to go, then I'll come around. If anybody's got any residual uh, logging in issues, then we will uh, get those sorted out. That's brilliant. Okay, I'll just I'll come and do yours in a second. So, um, what I thought we could do now was we'll spend a few minutes and I'll walk you through an example of how we would get people up and running um, on the platform. As I said, uh, I'll, I'll try and go fairly quickly. I'm, I'm just going to walk through it and I'll let you follow me through because I think that's probably going to be the most effective way of doing it. So we have a thing uh, called this uh, demo space. 
uh, and a space as an environment um, in which people uh, can come and uh, come and create individual tours. And in Wonder VR, we call a tour uh, an experience. So, has everybody managed to get in now? Yeah. Yep. So you should all be able to do exactly what I've just done, which is to click on the button that says "Create New Experience," and we've got a number of different ones, including some quite cool. 3D multi-user environments, but we're going to start off with 360 blank canvas. So if you can just click on that, you should see something that looks a little bit like this. So first of all, um, we'll put some media into it in a moment. And I'm just going to start off uh, here, and I think this is good practice. Before we get too far into it, we're going to give it a, a meaningful title and i'd always urge you to do this because what's going to happen over the next 20 minutes is this space is going to fill up with a number of different 360 experiences and if we all just accept the default 360 experience title um we're going to be uh, in a bit of a tangle so i'm going to go as gm demo uh, out c 23 so do do something similar you know, we don't have to reveal your name, but um, something that is uh, meaningful to you later. Once we've done that, we want to create our first image. So if we go over to the right hand side, um, what we'll see is uh, the opportunity is a empty scene to replace. But if I click on here and click on from this space, hopefully you should see some example images. And these are 360 images from uh, the Students' Union Concourse. The reason why I chose the Students' Union Concourse, by the way, should you be planning to do something like this in the future? I could have showed many different things, laboratories, field trips from all the way around the world, but that might disenfranchise some members of the audience from the others. So when I'm teaching this at University of Sheffield, everybody knows what the outside of the Students' Union looks like. They can actually concentrate on learning the tool rather than having any additional kind of layer of cognitive dissonance about trying to figure that, you know, they've, they've never been this place before. How do they know how to create a tour? They've all been here before. So that, so it's kind of spatially meaningful to them. So we're going to start off uh, outside the Students' Union. And what I'm going to do is give it a scene title um, outside the Students' Union, for example. And that's important because this becomes visible uh, later on, both to us and to the viewer. Now, at this very moment in time, we already have made a very elementary uh, 360 experience. If I click on launch, it will open it in a new tab. And away we go. So we've basically got, you know, if we did nothing else apart from this, we would have created a very simple 360 experience of outside the Sheffield University Students' Union. Okay, so now what we want to do is think about linking it. Um, has everybody had a chance to do that? Yeah, cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to link to an image and we'll link to a video. Down the left-hand side, where it says presentation, this is effectively becomes a list of all the locations or nodes, as I sometimes call them, in the virtual tour. So what I'm going to do, uh, by the way, which culture, um, WonderVR calls a scene. So I'm going to click on the new scene button and click on 360 image, uh, click on from this space. Uh, and I'm going to just click, click the next one because that was the one that was uh, in the tour. And this is actually just about 30 foot away that way. So what I need to do to get these two to link together is I'm going to create what we call a hotspot. And the way I do that is to click on this little hotspot uh, gallery here. And there's a load of different ones, but we kind of got into using this upward facing chevron because we felt it, it looked most like the one in Google Street View. And we felt that might be the thing that people, an end user might instinctively think, oh yeah, like an upward arrow that, you know, that, that could, could link me on to the, to the next place as it were. So, uh, what we could do is we could click and we can resize them and we can change the color and we could do various things like that. In order to get that to jump me over to the next scene, uh, I'm going to allocate to it what we call an action. An action is just a little bit of functional interactivity. So if I click on new action now, um, the first one available is uh, link. 
and it says link to scene. And then it asked me to select the scene. Now, actually, what I, what I didn't do uh, was um, a bit naughty. I didn't follow my own advice, which is to give things a good name. And this is actually just coming up with some random name that uh, the image comes as it comes off the camera. But we'll rectify that in a moment. Now, when I click on launch, um, when I click on this, it will take me to the next one. Now, again, the importance of giving things a meaningful title, which I am going to, going to correct, because this is a default numbering system uh, that the Insta cameras use. It's like a date stamp, basically. Now, if that's what this, the end view, you know, this is someone coming on a virtual tour to, to University Shepherd and they get confronted with this, it's not going to mean a fat lot to them. So I am going to uh, correct that now by giving that um, a better title. Amphitheater, okay. Um, so we've got um, two images linked. However, at this moment in time, we don't have a link back to the starting point. Now, if you're going to produce a guided tour where people can freely navigate around a space, I would say in most cases, if you link to somewhere, you should always be able to link back again. However, there's an exception to the rule. If I wanted to create something like an escape room, I might want to force people in a certain direction and only allow them the link back if they had performed some other functions, for example, a quiz or something like that. So you've actually got capacity to build that functionality in. Um, in the very short term, I'll just pop it back in now. I'll do another arrow and I'll get it to link uh, back to where we started from. So do that. Again, click on new action, click on link. And because now I've labeled my scenes properly, it's giving me a nice user-friendly uh, description to go back to. Uh, and you kind of have to get into this habit of doing something, click launch, test it, go back to it, because it doesn't, you, it doesn't update anything until you do that. Uh, so let's just check it's all going. Okay. Yep. Link that. Cool. So now we've got two scenes that link together, a mini virtual tour. If we want to, um, to add uh, a 360 video to that, we just basically follow the same procedure. We go, we kind of identify where we want to be. I think I'll launch it from there. We go new scene, and this time we're going to choose a 360 video. Uh, and this one is an equally cryptically titled vid, something, something, something. But this is what we call Western Park in Sheffield. So I'm going to give that a name. So Wonder VR effectively treats uh, video and images as, as the same. You can link to them, you can interact with them, you can label them, you can create hotspots on them. Um, and I'm going to do another little hotspot here. And you're going to guess what's coming next, I hope by now. I place my hotspot on the screen. I choose a link. And this time, I'm going to link to my Western Park video. Okay, so, so good so far. Uh, and I would, for completion, place a link on the way back. Okay, is everybody all right with that so far? You got a chance to do that? Anything coming from online, John? You know, uh, No questions. Lots of people, lots, lots of, of lots of scenes. Wow, brilliant. Very good. Good stuff. Uh, one question I've had. So one question I've had. Maybe oh. other people have got any questions through building. If you've got a video, sometimes there's sort of spaces that you can't drag content into. Um, it almost seems to be blurring out and sort of curving around. Is that a feature or? Uh, in, in this particular one? Yeah. Sorry, well, if you if you have uploaded a video and uh, it just seems... Well, you just uploaded a video now. Yes. Uh, yeah, probably have to look at the yeah, okay. video. No. It's, if it's um, what we call an equirectangular, video file which is the kind of video file which is the 
there's a certain kind of aspect ratio that images and mm -hmm. um, uh, 360 images and videos use. It should work unless it's not a complete 360. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that you will get, because video, uh, just while we're here, um, 360 cameras often use very wide angle lenses and they can cause a, a kind of spherical distortion. Um, so that's something to be aware of. So if I take a picture and I took the, stick the camera here next to verticals, uh, when, you, when you pan and tilt around, there's different kind of projections and it can go a bit weird. The other thing to really watch out for is that the budget cameras, the, the consumer level ones, are comprised of two image, uh, two lenses, both very wide angle, and uh, using the software in the camera, uh, they blend the two images together. At the point at which they blend is something called a stitch line, and that um, on some cameras can be a bit weird. So, for example, if you're doing a guided tour or if you're walking around, one is advised to not have an important feature like your face. I did one just when I was testing one and I thought, God, what's wrong with it? And I realized afterwards I'd held it in such a way that, my, that the center of my face uh, was smack in the middle of a stitch line and it looked like I had two not properly joined up heads, uh, which isn't brilliant for a guided tour. It might distract people. Okay. By the way, Graham, we've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Let me rush. Just a minute. Ask me again at the end, but that is a real problem. And it was interesting because we were talking about accessibility and on a number of sessions. Uh, for example, I think on the Tuesday, people were talking about providing accessibility statements. And this is an area which we are actively working with Wanda uh, to do so. VR immersive technologies are, they have some accessibility fundamentally sort of existential limitations in them, right? But that doesn't mean we can just ignore that. Uh, so there's a number of approaches. There is, I think it's probably WA, WCAG consortium are working on recommendations on to how this can be combated. Uh, the kinds of things will be, for example, keyboard navigation to pan and tilt, but we're not, I have to say we're not there yet. The importance of an accessibility statement is it's an opportunity to be explicit where that limitation takes place. Um, so I realize that's not necessarily the best answer in the world, but that's kind of what that is where we are. There's another, uh, there's another view to this, by the way, which is to say that um, there may be some accessibility issues with some aspects of it, but, all, but equally I can take somebody um, with mobility, severe mobility issues to places that they would never otherwise go. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, I think, um, when we're talking about but that. But it's really important, and we shouldn't lose sight of it. So, so thanks for bringing it up. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is, um, oops, jump the gun a bit. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do this. This these pop-up features. So I'm going to create uh, a little icon on here, which is like an information circle. Again. Information circle icon is pretty good. I think that's widely understood uh, as meaning a source of information, almost irrespective of, of language now. So what I want to happen is I want to be able to click on this and I want a little box to come up with some text in it. So what I have to do is I have to create the button and then I'm going to create the text box. And in this case, I'm going to create something that's called a card. Uh, so I created the card. It's come up on the screen. Did you see that, by the way? That's this button. Okay. Uh, and then what you can do is you can put some text in. So I'm going to say Octagon Center. Okay, and say, this is where you will graduate, you said, to the aspiring university entrance. Hey, okay. Now, in our original demo, we clicked on that and this popped up, but, but at the moment it's just there. So how are we going to deal with that? I'm going to click on it again, and I'm going to click on hide. So it's actually now invisible to the end viewer. But what we can do uh, is we can make this I button, make it appear and disappear. So I'm going to go down to actions again, because that's where the action happens. And instead of doing link this time, I'm going to do show and hide. And it says, select an annotation. And if I click on card, octagon center, and I use this show and hide toggle. 
when I hit the launch button, as you'll get a shout out uh, for next time, it will toggle the appearance and disappearance of this. Anything we see on screen can be made to be invisible and can be revealed by anything else on the screen. So coming back to the idea of building up some more complex logic, like an escape room out of some very simple components, we can make links appear or disappear depending on whether we've clicked on one thing or another thing. So again, we can set students tasks, we, we can reveal information to them on the basis of the performance. And that can also be things like links to other scenes or anything else. Okay, so what other kind of links did we do? We showed a video earlier on, right? So let's get a video up. And this time I'm gonna use uh, a text box. So go back to your first one, click on the text logo here. By default, everything appear, uh, kind of appears in the middle of the screen, wherever you were. This is obviously not very readable. Uh, so I'm just gonna put, Click for video, I'm not gonna bother. Click for video, um, and I'll put, put the same again. Okie dokie. And um, I'm gonna use the railway font because that's a sans serif font, which is uh, good for accessibility. I'm gonna make it a bit bigger because I don't think it's very visible at this stage. I go to 48. The white's kind of okay against that gray background. I'm just gonna resize it like that. So again, this isn't gonna do anything at the moment until I bring in a video. And this time we're gonna click on the video um, button. Again, click on from this space and click on campus tour. And uh, you can adjust things like whether you want it to automatically play, whether you want it to play um, uh, on a loop, what the volume is and so on. So I'm going to um, click on uh, this. I'm tempted just to turn it the volume off because, um, hello, I'm Hannah. I'm a journalism student. I hear that in my sleep sometimes when I teach this course because, uh, uh, you know, that's what happens. Oh, hold on. What did I forget to do? I wanted to hide it, didn't I? So it's uh, invisible until I use this label. So make sure your video is hidden. Click on, um, on the text label, click on the new action again, and this time show hide, and this time it's the video. Click on the launch button, I hear you all shout. Third year journalism student, I forgot the third year, cheers Anna. Okay, so that's that. Um, and then the last little bit is to is to bring in the uh, campus map. So we're going to follow the same procedure. We're going to bring the asset in. We're going to hide it. We're going to create an element to show and reveal it. And uh, Robert is your father's brother, as they say. So um, bring in the map, resize it uh, to taste. Oops. Put a label on screen. Oh, sorry, hide it. Put a label on screen. Uh, just to say to everyone, it is now 12.30 and officially the end of this session. So we do understand if you want to get yeah. out there and go and get some lunch, get out. do. If you want to wait till the crowds kind of yeah, down a you, little bit. You can either sit here and listen to me droning on, or you can spend 10 minutes in a queue for sandwiches. So <laughs> choice is yours, right? It's probably not the best choice you've ever had. But just for the sake of completion, I'll show you that uh, um, we now have it so that we show and hide the map. No, we don't, because I didn't do that bit. Okay. If people do want to stop on, I'm happy to wait on for a bit, so. Thanks, okay, Kevin. cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.
Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, cheers. So we will keep it to 10 minutes. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm happy to. So if anybody's got any more questions, I mean, that's pretty much where we are with, with building a uh, simple 3D experience, 360 experience. Just in case, just in terms of where we are now, um, you know, we are at that kind of driving adoption forward now and collating ex, uh, examples. And that's pretty much where we are. Um, cheers, thank you. Yeah, yeah you're great. So, um, <laughs> so, the one other thing that people might be interested in, actually, which is quite fun, uh, is just um, there are there are other uses um, for the technology which some people have got quite excited by. So, um, there's a thing that you can do where you can create 3D environments, and they just come as a series of templates. Uh, and this is a little bit like our colleagues from Leeds were showing us yesterday, uh, which they did with the insect gallery. And um, just waiting for this to load up. This is a multi-user 3D experience. So you can actually share this with, up, I think it's up to 30 students at the moment, but they are increasing the capacity. Um, so this is Tom again, our, my our volcanologist friend, who also teaches other aspects of physical geography. Um, and he's... Um, <clears throat> Uh, done a practical class with his students whereby he's taken a number of 3D models of various different rock types and he brings them in and the students go through and they work in groups and they have to identify the various different types of rock. Uh, um, he's done another one on volcanology uh, where the students go through and they're shown various different uh, 3D environments, and that links through to a quiz that they do on Blackboard, and they can do this uh, multi-user collaboratively. So that, that's, as I said, one of the unexpected uh, benefits that we've actually um, received from the platform. As I said, we went into it really with um, 360 hosting in mind, but it does all, they are also very, active, very much actively developing this um, multi-user 3D functionality as well, which is very exciting. Um, and then there's a final one, um, which is a real R&D thing. Um, we're working, uh, this is a new technology which Wonder are developing, and uh, it enables you to have um, uh, avatars that are powered by chat GPT. Um, and here's my alter ego, Dr. Xavier, who's a senior digital learning advisor. Um, so I'm going to ask Xavier a, a, um, a question. And this will, this will now um, actually bring in um, uh, use chat GPT to answer any kind of question I ask it. So this is actually, I don't know whether this is from your knowledge base, John, but uh, this is straightforward. Oh, that's nice. Very good. One, log into your account again. Two. Sounds just like me as well. Sounds just like John. Find the video you want to publish. You click on the actions button next to it. Four. Select publish from the drop down. Five. Choose the publishing option. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Six. Click on the save button. Your video will be published in excess of the intended audience for attention to send it. You can actually talk to it. It will talk back to you. It's got speech recognition two-way uh, built in, so you can actually interact you with it. GPT and teaching would be a great way to engage students. In the okay, so that's where we are now. Here are a few ways so this is a new feature this is just like really just we're just been testing this out now uh, we're working with some um, students they can ask questions related to the topic shut up say yeah honestly uh yeah so this is something we've been working on over the summer mainly with some of our uh, education research students uh, sorry um educational psychology students who have been building up avatars of um of uh, learners with specific learning needs. They've been building, uh, training them to 
with lots and lots of evidence which will be gathered from real learners with you know various specific uh, learning needs uh, which they then interact with and use as, as a as a kind of dialogue and training tool but that's just kind of as i said that's an r d thing so yeah. watch this space is uh, for that and that really is um the final bit of it apart from to say what we've not done yet is really evaluated it pedagogically uh, we know that it kind of technically works and i think that's the, the the big next step for us now is to is to really get those use cases evaluate with students how it's really benefiting their learning we've had some pre you know, preliminary evaluation which has kind of gone well and that's where we are now so thanks very much again for coming and stopping the three minutes extra or whatever it is that you've uh, suffered. Thank you. Any final questions for Graham? Any comments? Yeah, so you oh. uh, did, um, what we really wanted uh, is going back to that requirements again, uh, which is we really wanted something that was going to be um, very easy to use out of the box and it had to have that multi-user thing i know h5p has got that functionality but we are not really exactly it's a bit like that uh, i think like a lot of organizations which i think we have an emphasis on on getting you know solutions that don't really require an awful lot of local customization i think the h5p approach whilst you could no doubt probably write stuff with, with additional functionality but and we don't really use H5P for anything else. I think if we were using it a lot, you know, it's great for, for building stuff, isn't it? Like, you know, other forms of e-learning content, but we've not really been doing it. So that's, we're not Moodle users, no, we're Blackboard users. So yeah, I mean, H5P and Moodle, uh, I'm sure there's lots of great stuff there. Um, there's another product on the market that a lot of people look at and we didn't do that because we didn't feel it handled the video as well. The fact that Wonder would link directly to our Kaltura storage estate, sim I thought it was very appealing for us to, to sort of simplify some of those solutions and, you know, seek integrations where we can rather than proliferations. Consolidation, I think, is rather than, yeah, do you know what I mean? You know, there's lots of good reasons for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, thanks, thank you very much, John. Cheers, Greg. Cheers, thank, thank you. Thanks for everyone for staying as well. Thank you, yeah. Excellent session.